back in time uh, like a song. <laughs> Is that the same for you? You hear a song, maybe, uh, you know, an oldie but goodie uh, from your era, <laughs> whatever that may have been, and uh, it takes you right back to those days, and you, and you maybe have uh, fond memories or something that just comes upon you, or maybe there was some difficulty that you were struggling with in your life, and there was some song that maybe helped you get through that hardship, and, and I know that we're grateful for such things as that. Well, the Psalms are songs, and they do very much the same thing. Uh, they're there. I, I look at the Psalms like this. They're almost like friends that are waiting for your time of need. And you can go back to a Psalm that has helped you at some point in your life, and then you go back and read it again, and it's like an old friend with exactly the same comfort, the same help, the same attitude, and boy, you're just right back there in that good place with the Lord. So I'm loving it that we're going to travel through these 150 oldies, and as we count them down, we're on Psalms 3 and 4. Now, uh, I did say these are connected, a morning and an evening psalm. Uh, I could have also called this teaching the opening and closing of one really rough day, and we're going to see that that's true. So let me give you very briefly the occasion upon which David wrote. And isn't that nice to know that we know both these psalms are written by King David. King David's an interesting guy, isn't he? He, he was a musician. Uh, he was a, a warrior. Uh, he was a man of great faith. Uh, he, was, uh, 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 he was a dancer. That is true, isn't it? <laughs> he, he just seemed to be, he seems to be a character who is larger than life. Uh, but at the same time, David had a lot of faults. He had feet of clay, he stumbled, he tripped, he was afraid, he did dumb things. And it seems as though we're all able in some way to be able to relate to David. And so when you come across David's Psalms, they have a, they, they have a way of, well, they kind of like find whatever crack there is in your heart. And, and his psalms are able to seep right into that crack like, like a salve, like something that heals, you know, like a balm, as they say. So uh, here's the occasion of the writing of these two. So, and you could read it if you want on your leisure, Second Samuel chapters 15 through 18. But David's son Absalom had gone to Hebron and while he was in Hebron, he began doing this kind of a political thing where he started talking down David and he started talking himself up. Oh, David doesn't have time for you. Oh, David, you know, has committed a lot of sins. Why don't you bring your trouble to me and I'll help you out? And so he was kind of, well, he was taking away from David's kingdom while living right within David's kingdom. It's a very odd kind of a thing that was going on. So Absalom knows that it's all come out within David's kingdom about David's sin with Bathsheba. David having given the orders that caused the death of her husband Uriah, who was a good man and was loyal to David. Nathan, the prophet, if you'll remember, had come to David and he ended up prophesying to David. David had tried to keep it a secret. Uh, but how many of us who walk with the Lord know how hard it is to keep a sin, a secret. Isn't that a tough one? <laughs> the Holy Spirit will keep whispering to us. Uh, he, the Holy Spirit may even shine a spotlight on our sin. There's something that takes place internally where we just go, oh, I just, I, I can't go on with this anymore, you know? Uh, maybe communion comes up and it's like, oh man, I'm not really, really right with God. And so, uh, you know, Nathan comes to David and tells him this story about, a, about this poor guy. And this poor guy lives next door to a rich guy. And uh, the uh, rich guy is going to have a feast. And the rich guy says, oh, I don't want to kill any of my lambs. <laughs> Let me take the lamb from the guy, the poor guy next door. Now, the poor guy next door had a lamb, but it wasn't just a regular lamb. It was a lamb that he had actually made part of his family. I don't know if any of you have dogs that are like part of your family. 
<laughs> that can happen, <laughs> Judy, for sure. That can happen where the, the puppy dog becomes part of the family. Well, this lamb had become part of the family. And the rich guy came and stole the lamb and cooked it and fed his guests. David, of course, blew his cork. David says, who is that guy? Bring him before me. I'll give him what for. And right then, Nathan the prophet, and I picture this long bony finger as he points at David, and he goes, David, you are the man who stole from next door. And at that, that broke David. It was the truth that breaks. And the truth that breaks from the word of God is always the truth that heals. But David learned something very significant at this point. The significant thing that David learned was, what you sow, you shall also reap. reap. Whatever you plant is going to eventually come up. So careful what you plant in your eyes, your ears, and in your heart, because eventually it will come up. David learned that lesson the hardest way, because Nathan the prophet said to David, from now on, the sword is not going to depart from your home. It's going to be a rough ride for you in your home, David. So now the chicken has come home to roost, as they say. The, uh, what was planted by David has now popped up in his garden. Now the one-time chief counselor of David, a guy by the name of Ahithophel, and Ahithophel said, well, it was said of Ahithophel, that when he spoke, it was as though you were hearing the oracles of God. I mean, Ahithophel was one blessed, smart, wonderful guy. But there was a problem. Ahithophel turned on David. Why did he turn upon him? Because we come to find out that Ahithophel's granddaughter was none other than Bathsheba. And I can tell you right now, somebody's going to mess with my granddaughter. <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be hard on that poor person. You know, you'll have to hold me back. And so he wanted his pound of flesh from David. So he goes in cahoots, as it said, with Absalom, and he starts helping Absalom, Absalom out and starts uh, showing that, that he's using his political position in order to move people away from David, including David's armies and David's leaders, to Absalom. Now... Here comes Absalom then marching on Jerusalem to overthrow David and to put him out of his kingdom. Well, actually to kill David. That's what it, his plan was. There's thousands that are gathered against David, even parts of his own army marching on Jerusalem. I don't know if you can imagine what that would be like for David. Not, not only do all these people are against him, these people who once sang, they sang songs about David. Did you know that? They used to sing songs about David, and now they're like, that dirty rat, we're going to get him. And not only that, but David has his own son that is marching against him. David is pressed on all sides. I don't know how, how your day was today, but this day of Psalms 3 and 4 was a very, very bad day for David. David is betrayed by his own son. I don't know, have you ever been betrayed? If you've not been betrayed, then I would say you haven't lived very long. <laughs> and now, in his brokenness, David's psalms. This is an interesting thing. Some folks have lined up David's psalms from before he sinned with Bathsheba and Uriah, killing him, to afterwards. And the psalms that David wrote after being crushed by that those are the most loved psalms of David. There was a depth, there was a deepness, there was a, a connectedness, a crying out to God that you can only find in those places of deep repentance. And when you're calling out on God and you find out how close he really is, even in the hard times. Let's get to it. Psalm 3. Let me just read it. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God, Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, the one who lifts up my head. 
I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill, Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people, Selah. That's just awesome. There's something about, you know, some of David's psalms that I have this sense that I just want to be very quiet and very respectful and like the fly on the wall who's hearing somebody who has been through a lot of troubles or great difficulties and they're just pouring out and expressing themselves. You know, you may not, uh, I don't know how you feel about this terminology I'm going to use, but sometimes in the psalms, especially with David, it is almost as though it is almost as though David takes his, all his thoughts, feelings, emotions, and he kind of, well, he kind of throws up. He just throws up his emotions. out of. They just come out of this place like, like, whoa, you know, to the Lord. And you know what? That is a good thing between you and the Lord to have such a relationship that whatever is there, there's no cleaning it up. There's no worrying about your phraseology. There's just the letting it all go onto the Lord. And here's what it's like with the Lord. And I don't care how old you are because you're his child. It's like the Lord's holding you. And there you are hurting. And he's patting you. And you're like the little baby. He goes, <laughs> And the Lord goes, isn't that cute? <laughs> so you can cast all of your cares upon him. Because the Bible says he cares for you. All right, here we go. Lord... Verse 1, how they have increased to trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. I don't know if you've ever felt outnumbered. You ever felt the tide shift in your life or in your home or in your ministry? You ever felt that shifting tide and it just seems like more than you can possibly bear? And maybe it's not even people. Maybe it's just a certain set of circumstances that has come your way. Or maybe it is people. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's your teacher. Maybe it's somebody in your family. Maybe it's your bills. Just too big for me to handle. One of the many things about David that are beautiful is that David knew where to take his troubles. Where do you take your troubles? What do you, what do, you do with them? And you deal with them somehow. Some folks say, I'm going to get plastered tonight. I got a lot of troubles. It's time for happy hour. By the way, happy hour is the most unhappy hour I've ever seen. Maybe you just go to the hotline and you just go through your <laughs> go through your Rolodex. How many know what a Rolodex is? <laughs> I'm showing my age. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you go to your list of contacts on your iPhone. <laughs> and you just let everybody know with your little violin, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Hey, God wants to know. God does know, and he wants to know from you what it is that you're going through. Once everybody loved David, now it doesn't look that way at all. David has repented before God, and God has received his repentance. Uh, David's sinned before God. Look. Here's an interesting thing. We look at David's sins and we go, man, that's fantastic. That's really off the charts there. But then you look at Solomon's and you go, well, Solomon ruled in a time of peace. And whatever did Solomon do? Because God rebuked Solomon sternly. But David, he did not. You ever wonder why? Here's two kings, father and son. One ruled during time of war. That was David. One ruled during time of peace, that was Solomon, wisest man that ever lived. God takes Solomon to task, but he does not take David to task. In fact, God says of David, he's a man after my own heart. You ever wonder why that would be? The reason why that is, is because when David did good, he did good before his God. When David sinned, he sinned before his God. And when David repented, he repented before his God. He was always 
in relationship with his God. Solomon, on the other hand, ended up building temples to false gods. David never did that. David came in brokenness, and God always received him. What does that tell us then? That tells us to do the same thing. There are no perfect people. We all need to go to God with whatever our hurt or brokenness is, whatever our help may need. David knows where to take his. And he says, many are they that say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. Jesus is called the son of David. And oftentimes in the Psalms, there's a dual way of looking at them. You can look at the Psalms based on the situation and circumstances that were taking place at that time, if we know them. And you can also take a look at the Psalms of David where he speaks. And oftentimes it is as though the Messiah, the son of David, is speaking himself. These are the kinds of things that they were saying about Christ upon the cross. There is no help for him in God. I can't think of a worse thing or worse thought for a believer than to carry with them this kind of a thought, that's it for me. There is no help for me anywhere. There's not even any help for me in God. That's the worst thought that I could probably come up with. And then I want you to look at that last word. What is it? Selah. <laughs> and that word means, well, it actually, uh, that word is a musical term. Remember, these are songs. And so there was a musical term there called selah. And what it meant was the music came to a crescendo. And then there was a pause. Now, when we translate it into our terminology as we read through the Psalms, when you come across that Selah, what it means is stop and think about that. So David says, Lord, there's so many that are against me. How did they all rise up? There's a lot of them that they're saying. They're saying this of me. There is no help for him in God. Stop and think about that one for a moment. But I'll tell you what, the next four words change everything. The next four words can change everything in your life and mine, regardless of the circumstance. And here it is. But you, O oh Lord, those are the four words that change everything. How many times might you have said something came up that was going to finish you off? Something had come up that it was going to take you down for the count. But then those four words but you, O oh Lord. It's almost as though you're switching from one kind of a system to another. It's almost as though you're engaged in what's happening and you're struggling and you're fighting against this circumstance or against that person or against this accusation or that lie or something that's come against you that's bigger than what you are, a health issue, whatever it may be, and you're just all fighting on this level. And then all of a sudden the thought strikes you, wait a minute, I'm not alone in all of this. And you switch gears. And the switching of the gears is, but you, O oh God, wait a minute, I'm not alone. Wait a minute, there is a God I know that loves me and gave himself for me, but you, O oh God. And then he says, art a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. All right. Since David was a warrior... I wonder how many times David might have been on the battlefield and might have been saved by a shield. <laughs> Spears and arrows are coming at this guy. Do you think he knew the benefit of a shield? Wow, we, he sure did, didn't he? Plunk, 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 plunk. And there he stood. When spears and arrows are flying at you and me and you happen to be out on the open, it's a great benefit. Can you imagine being out in the open and having the benefit of being able to hunker down behind a shield? When you have trouble coming your way and there's something between you and the trouble, that's a good thing. When trouble comes your way and what's between you and your trouble is God, whoa, okay, that's a great thing. So I'm always positioning myself 
So I'm standing behind my big brother, Jesus. <laughs> Satan, you deal with him. Lord, I'm standing right here behind you. You're my shield. It's interesting to know that just living in a fallen world and that everything can change in a hurry, it's a nice thing to know that God is there as a shield for your life, no matter what it is you face. And we may not actually face arrows or bullets. Maybe we might. But we'll all face accusations at one point or another, both true and untrue. And not that God is just my shield, but he's also my glory. Now, David was a king. And David was a king like no other. And to this day, he's considered the greatest king who ever ruled over Israel. I mean, that guy had it going on. <laughs> and yet, with all his kingliness, <laughs> and the palaces, and the temple, and all the concubines, with all that David had, when it came to his glory, he said, God, you're my glory. And of all the things that could lift my head, David would say, it's not my wealth, it's not my gold. And he had plenty of gold, and he sent away to the, to the mines, uh, golds of Orphir down there in, in, uh, uh, in Africa. Of all the things that uh, David had, he said, you know what? It's God who lifts up my head. That's where it really comes from. That's, that's eternal. Here's my prize. Lord, my prize is no matter what I face, you're my shield and you're my glory. And when I'm down, Lord God, you're the one who lifts up my head. I'm believing that. I'm trusting in that. And remember, David has got a whole of his army, practically, that's marching on him at this point. You know who doesn't understand this? Absalom. Absalom doesn't understand this. Absalom says, I want David's throne. Absalom says, I want David's gold. Absalom says, I want David's concubines, which is what he did. He went up on the rooftop where everybody could see, and, and he had sexual relations with, with a bunch of different women up there. I mean, he just totally blew it. Absalom wanted his own glory. He, Absalom was working for himself. Versus us and our, no matter what we face, to say to God, you're my shield. You're my real glory. You're the one who finds me in that place where I'm crushed. That thing that is bigger than I am. You're the one that's able to lift up my head. Verse 4, David says, I cried to the Lord with my voice. And he heard me from his holy hill. Think about that one for a moment. <laughs> Notice it says God heard me from his holy hill. Well, where's God's holy hill? Where would that be? Mount Zion. Not Mount Zion. Where's God's holy hill? Verse 4 is almost like a New Testament verse. David is getting kicked out of Jerusalem. And he says, it's not the temple that God heard me from. God heard me from his holy hill. That'd be heaven. Remember, remember, this is, this is what the Lord knows, and I believe this is the revelation that David gets. The temple is just a model. It's just a model. <laughs> it's not the real thing. The real thing is in heaven. As a matter of fact, uh, you look at the model so that when you get to heaven, you won't look like a tourist. You know? You'll look at some of the things, and you'll say, oh, yeah, I know what that is, and that is, and how that works. The real thing's in heaven. And David, as he's being kicked out of Jerusalem, says, The Lord heard me when I cried to him from his holy hill. God heard him, and he gave to David what he'll give to you and me, even in a place of trouble, and that's peace. Real peace. Not a peace based on people, not a peace based on circumstances, not a peace based on health, not a peace based on money, not a peace based on anything earthly. God gives us a peace that's based on him himself. How important is it then that I know who God is and I know who I am with him and that I keep holy before him? Not holy in the sense that I've reached some state of perfection. You know what perfection is for a Christian? Not perfection in perf it's not perfection in performance. 
Because there's none of us, even after salvation, who will ever attain to perfection in performance before a holy, holy, holy God. But it is perfection in relationship. And I think David was pretty doggone close to that. Yeah, he sinned, but boy, did he know how to repent. And he was serious about it. And all of his hope and his trust was in the Lord. So look what happens in verse 5. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. That's why this makes this a morning song. I awoke, <laughs> for the Lord sustained me. David here gives two evidences of the fact that the Lord heard him. Here's good evidences that God hears you. Number one, I finally was able to go to sleep. <laughs> and number two, I woke up, <laughs> which means I'm still here. I'm still in the land of the living. Even with all the troubles I've faced, apparently God's not done with me and God's not done with you if you're still breathing. <laughs> Are you still breathing? Did you wake up this morning? <laughs> then God still wants to use your life. Verse 6, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people who have set themselves against me all around. Okay, I got a question I'd like to ask David. David, uh, how many are after you? David says 10,000s. Then David says, but that's okay because I know the Lord has heard me. So I'm going to sleep. <laughs> One Bible commentator wrote the following. God sustains us in our sleep. But we take that for granted. But think of it. You're asleep. You're unconscious. You're dead to the world. Yet you breathe. Yet your heart pumps. Your organs operate. Well then, the same God who sustains us in our sleep is the same God who will sustain us when we are awake in our difficulties. You know, uh, interesting thing, just a, a side comment here about the world today. The Church of Jesus Christ, not of Latter-day Saints, but the Church of Jesus Christ, is finding itself on a smaller and smaller island within our culture. Uh, more and more hostility than ever is being shot at Christians. More and more ridicule. Uh, if you want to keep the morality that God gives you through his word, you're going to have to fight to keep it. And you're going to have to have a lot of mud thrown at you. That's just the way it's working. And I think it's very possible if things continue along the very same vein that they have been the last few years. That we're going to be Jesus Christ Church in America who will say, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. And so I'll tell you this. If the laws change and we can't teach certain parts of the Bible, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep on teaching them. <laughs> Even if it means an instant prison ministry, I will be there in front or behind bars still teaching God's word. Verse 7 says, Arise, O Lord. That's interesting that David says that. And just quickly, I'll point to the fact that Moses liked to pray that. That was one of Moses' prayers. Moses' prayer was, Arise, O Lord. And go before us. And let our enemies flee from before us. So David, I don't know if he took that from Moses or not, but it's pretty cool. David says, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. For you have struck all my enemies on their cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. I don't know. Uh, uh, here's another quiz question then for you. How many times did David lose in battle? That would be... None. <laughs> Did you know that David could have stayed and fought Absalom, but he didn't do it? What do you think would have happened if David would have fought and stayed and fought Absalom? It ended bad for Absalom anyway. David was God's anointed. That was the end of the story there. <laughs> God was going to bless him. God was going to protect him, no matter what flew at him and what came at him, because he always trusted in God, you know? There was a uh, beautiful relationship there between the Lord and with David. And boy, I tell you, you should be wanting that kind of a relationship yourself. A man or a woman after God's own heart. So uh, this is like David saying then in verse 7. Uh, it's kind of like David saying, here we are again, Lord. 
in another battle. Arise, O Lord, meaning you fight for me. You saved me. Oh my God, you have broken the teeth of the ungodly. David likes that expression, and it's going to come up again. He just, he just likes it. So I was like, okay, I wonder what he ever saw in battle or whatever happened that he would glom onto that, break the teeth of the enemy, you know, break the teeth of the ungodly. Well, I thought this. It's an expression that means if the enemy has his teeth broken out, then all he can do is gum you, which is not nearly as bad as teeth. Verse 8, salvation belongs to the Lord. In other words, God always has the final say. And David is saying, I'm willing to submit to God's final say. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. What do you think about that? Selah. Great morning prayer. For those mornings when you know it's going to be a tough day. For those mornings when you get up and the song that you're singing is, Mama said there'd be days like this. <laughs> there'd be days like this, my mama said. But God is always a match, and he's a greater match for any of the enemies that come against you. And when David says, your blessing is upon your people, let me tell you what he's sliding in there. Lord, I know that your blessings are upon your people, and guess what, Lord? I'm one of your people. So, Lord, bless me. That's just a lovely psalm, isn't it? What do you think about that? Psalm 4 is a very personal psalm. So this is in the evening of that day. Boy, what a day, huh? David goes, I wrote that song in the morning when I woke up and I was still alive. Now here's a new song I'm going to write tonight. Very personal song. He's, in this song, he goes, I call, my distress, hear my prayer. Uh, he just speaks that way throughout this entire psalm. So this is very personal to David. And this tells us something also. Uh, David receive, uh, the Lord receives this very personal song from David. So it tells us that our God is also a very personal God. He's not aloof. He's not distant. He doesn't overlook any of his kids. He's never overlooked you. Even when you were hurting and you didn't think he was there, he was there. He helped you through. And uh, let me add in this thing too. Have real prayers, will you? Real, honest prayers that speak from where you live. I believe that that's what the Lord really wants from us. Be real with him. At no point will God ever hear your prayer and say, well, I didn't know you really felt that way. He, he knows. But if you try to fake him out with some, I don't know, super spiritual mumbo jumbo, the Lord will look at you and I think, oh, like, get real, you know? get real. Um, his shoulders can handle your pain, believe me. We've seen that at the cross. Psalm 4. To the chief musician, whenever it says that, it means that this was a public prayer, a song for everybody to sing. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. There are some early Hebrew writings that say that uh, do, uh, with a musical terminology, niganoth. <laughs> Sometimes it's said on niganoth. <laughs> And uh, that's, I just like saying that word, niganoth. And uh, uh, what it was, was it meant when you played this, really, really pluck it. It was supposed to be plucked, pluck, pluck. And the thought was, is that this is what was happening to David's life. It's as though the difficulties of his life were like plucking on him. This is a song on niganoth, you know. To the chief musician with stringed instruments, a psalm of David. Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. First awesome understanding to have is that we do not, that we cannot create our own righteousness before a holy God. Futile to even try that. Everyone fails at it. No one succeeds at it, not even one, the Bible tells us in Romans. There's not one good, no, not one. So when David says, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness, he's not saying, God, hear me because I'm righteous. He's saying, God, hear me because you have provided for me righteousness. I never trust to stand on my own efforts before God. 
I always trust to stand on the efforts and completed work of Christ. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you that Jesus is my righteousness. I don't have any of my own, so I take from Christ what he freely gives me through faith in him. So he says, hear me when I call you, O God. You have relieved me in my distress. This is kind of a so. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. David is asking for mercy. Beautiful prayer is to ask for mercy. An unbeautiful prayer would be to pray for justice. As a matter of fact, any time that you decide that you want to pray for justice, please tell me ahead of time so I can move out of the way. <laughs> Just in case God decides to give you justice. When you pray for mercy, it is like saying, Oh Lord, please do not let me get what I deserve. So it's not, it's not like this religious terminology. Oh, I pray to thee, O oh Lord, for mercy, you know. No, it's like saying, it's like saying Lord, uh, what I deserve, please don't let that happen to me. That's what mercy is. Now what's interesting to me is that when David asks for God's mercy, he is pointing to the past. Take a look at it. David says, you have relieved me in my distress. That's past tense. You, you've relieved me. You've helped me in my past. Anybody here who knows they'd be wiped out unless God stepped in at some point and saved your bacon? <laughs> Absolutely, huh? <laughs> so David is almost doing this thing. He is counting on a track record that has been established with God based upon his long-term relationship with him. Ah, I could do the same thing. Hey, Lord, remember when you saved me and rescued me from that trouble? Remember when you were there and I hurt so bad in that thing and yet you came and relieved me? Oh, Lord, let that be just like now. And because you showed me mercy then, Lord God, I ask that you would show me mercy now. Aren't these things encouraging to you? I mean, this is greatly encouraging to me. This is like telling me and telling you. It's, it's like the Lord saying, hey, look, you can count on me. There are things you're going to face that are bigger than you. But I want you to know through these psalms that you can count on me. Now, now stop being so down. Let me be the lifter of your head. Let me be the shield for you. So that you can finally get a good night's snooze. And you can wake up in the morning because I'm going to watch over you during the night. Boy, that's beautiful to have that kind of relationship with God. Verse 2. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory to shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Think about that for a little bit. Now, I believe that Psalm 2, uh, Psalm 4 verse 2 is another one of those verses that I believe is messianic okay first of all let's just take it based on David and the fact that his son is kicking him out of Jerusalem David is saying man those enemies out there are out to get me I know that I've been given a God given position by God to rule and reign in this kingdom yet they're marching against me led by my own son Lord that's that's false. That's worthless. That's wrong. And you may have things that are wrong in your life. <laughs> you have enemies. I have enemies. Guess what? Every morning you wake up, you're going to have enemies of your own sin and enemies of your own temptation. They're right there. The book of Genesis says they're crouching at the door, waiting to get you, you know. Maybe it's your short temper. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's just the plain old pain of you now having to reap what you've sown in your life. If you go out to your garden and you've only thrown weeds in your garden, you can't expect to open the back door to your house and there'll be this beautiful garden with, you know, trellises and uh, tomatoes and... Uh, all those other, it's just not, will that happen? That's not going to happen, is it? All right, now let's look at it in a messianic way. 
I want you to consider Jesus Christ speaking to humanity. Let's say all humanity. And Jesus speaking in verse 2 says the following. How long, O you sons of men, will you turn my glory into shame? How long will you love worthlessness and seek falsehood? Now think about that for a moment. To me, verse 2 is a loving, pleading from God, calling to us the humanity that he has created and calling to each one of us individually. And he says like this to you and me, hey, come on. Why are you living like that? Don't you understand that I have something better for you? I have a greater way for you to live. Don't live low. (laughs) Live high. Keep your eyes off me. Stop trusting what's around you. Trust me. It is a loving, pleading thing of God because God is saying if you continue that way, you'll get to the end of your life and it will have been worthless. It won't count. It will have been false. Verse 3. But know that the Lord has set apart for himself who is godly. The Lord will hear when I call him. Well, honey, you look at verse 3 and you might think right offhand, oh my gosh, how do you get to be one of these godly people that that God is going to help? Well, it's all wrapped up in those two words, set apart. See that? But know that the Lord has set apart. Set apart is a definition of holiness. Being holy carries with it the idea of being set apart for the purposes of God. That's all that it means. What could be holier than living in a way that you know is within God's will? That would be how it is that God wants you to live. You're set apart. And to not live a set apart life, well, there's a definition for that too. And that's called selfishness. And you will come to find that holiness and selfishness, they don't mix. There has to be a point at which each one of us, and sometimes on a daily basis, and sometimes on a minute by minute basis, where I say, you know what, I know what I'd like to do right now. I know what I'd like to say right now. I know where I'd like to go. I know where I'd like to be. I know what I want right now. But instead, oh God, I want your will. And I want to go your way. Because I know that my life, my tongue, my feet, my work is set apart for the purposes of God. There can be a sense in each one of us where we get excited about that. I'm not living just any old life. I'm living a life that is set apart by God. You know, uh, as I thought about this, and wanting to be really real with you, I've thought to myself, (laughs) there have been times in my life where I have been very selfish. A very selfish man. And it seems interesting to me that in those times when I'm selfish and I catch myself, that I'll think and I'll even pray, oh Lord, this is it, isn't it? This is the point at which you're done with me. I've just I've proven myself too selfish to be set apart for your purpose. Mm-hmm. When I have done that, Right in the middle of my prayers and in my thoughts like that, God comes along and he interrupts me. And he interrupts me with his love. And he refreshes me and says, no, 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 Paul. You're my child. I have no intention of giving up on you. The good work that I have begun in you, I'll complete it. And you'll see my work completed in you as you stand before Christ. I'm just like, oh, Lord, you're so good to me. And then the Lord says, now let's get that sin forgiven. Let's get squared away in that part of your life and let's try again tomorrow morning. I say, okay, Lord, let's do that. That's our Lord. 
Verse 4 says, Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. Think about that one for a minute. <laughs> you know, each one here could say, uh, I have good cause to be angry. Uh, I want you to know that this happened to me. And I want you to know that that happened to me. And I want you to know that this one did that to me and that one did this to me. And I could listen to every one of your complaints and I could say to you, I agree with you. You have cause to be angry. You have cause to be angry. That was wrong. That wasn't right. But listen to me. Though you may have every cause to be angry, do not let your anger cause you to sin. Let me explain what sin is really quick. A good definition of sin is anything you think, do, say, or don't do that separates you from God. That's sin. So you may have right cause to be angry, but listen to me, even in your anger, do not let yourself be separated by the only one who can actually help you. Don't let yourself, in your anger, don't make some choice on your anger that will result in you being separate from the one who's your shield and your glory and the one who lifts you up and the one who forgives you and the one who loves you and the one who's working on you and the one who set you apart. You see how that works? Be angry and sin not. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. First, Meditate within your heart. Uh, this is uh, like, uh, I think I heard some kind of a, a, a game years ago. I, I don't remember the situation that it was, but it was like one of those, uh, you know, conversational games where you say to somebody, okay, I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to answer it as honestly as you can. And you say, what do you want? The person goes, what do I want? You go, yeah, what do you want? And uh, then the person goes, well, I don't know. It was a rough day. I'd like to have a drink. Okay. Uh, why is it that you want a drink? What? <laughs> why is it that you want a drink? Well, I already said it was a really hard day, so I really want a drink. W why did you have a hard day? Well, it was really difficult with my boss at work. Well, why was it really difficult with your boss at work? And the idea is you keep going down layer after layer after layer till you find out what you really want. And in, if a person is honest, you know what they'll come to? I don't want to be alone. I want to be loved. I want peace. See, what, what these psalms do are saying, okay, look, you're angry at life. Things are hard. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to meditate within your heart. Lay down on your bed. Be still because we know that when we're still, what? Then we know what? Okay. <laughs> the pro <laughs> the pro Be still and know that I'm God. Psalm 46, verse 10. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I'm God. When you're still as a child of God and you're meditating within yourself, in other words, you're being totally honest with God who already knows what's on that bottom level because he created all of us. And the Lord is saying, well, now that you're down there where you really live, now that you're down there where you really live and what you really want to be loved, to not be alone, maybe it is you don't want to die. <laughs> maybe you want real peace in your life. Those are the real deal things. Then God says to you, those are found in me. Because the things that you want now, you're talking on an eternal level, and you've been trying to fill your life with temporal things. A faster car. <laughs> oh, if I only had nitrous. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> then I'd be really fulfilled, you know. <laughs> or if I had that knucklehead Harley, man, then that'd be right, you know. Whatever it may be, you know. But what it really is are things that cannot be satisfied by temporal input. Because things rust and and destroy and get, you know, they, people can break in and steal that thing that was supposed to make you so happy. And then what will happen? Then you're not happy anymore. 
because that thing got stolen. But God says he can provide those things for you. Now, Elijah, the prophet, uh, uh, he first saw the fire. And he said God was not in the fire. And then he saw the whirlwind. God was not in the whirlwind. Then he saw the earthquake. God was not in the earthquake. But then God spoke to him in a still, small voice. That's what that verse is trying to get to. Gang, get before God. In your own heart of heart of heart of heart of hearts, be still and wait on him. Verse 5 says, offer the sacrifice of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Now, okay, David is definitely thinking Old Testament here because they had a number of sacrifices, didn't they? They had sin offerings, they had peace offerings, they had burnt offerings, they had offerings of consecration. Remember us going through those things? Okay, we went through all those in Leviticus. But they also had uh, sacrifices that were more like sacrifices of fellowship. So, I mean, this is like a really cool deal. I would go and bring my sacrifice and I bring it to the to the priest and he would butcher it. And then he would sacrifice part of it, but the rest of it he would just cook up like a bar- barbecue for me. How would you like that? It's like the Lord saying that. How would you like that? Anybody here like a barbecued lamb? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. How would you like that? Medium rare? Lord, let's sit down and have a barbecue together. Lord, let's sit down in the peace offering. And let's just have fellowship together. That's a beautiful thing. Today, what we find is that Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the sacrificial system. For sin, for righteousness, for consecration, it's Jesus. Uh, for fellowship, it's Jesus. For peace, it's Jesus. So when that's why we pray in Jesus' name. I bring Jesus as my sacrifice. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Verse 6, there are many who say, who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. Now, now, look what David is saying here. Again, this shows David has a great grasp of spirituality. Here's how I would probably have written it if I was David, which is why I'm not David. There are many who say, who will show us any good? My answer to that, if I were David, was... So, O oh Lord, return me to my palace and those great goblets of wine and the good meals and all that stuff, you know? But David doesn't say that. He says, there's people who say, who's going to show us any good? So, Lord, what I want you to do is I want you to bring your countenance, bring your presence upon us. The light of your presence takes greater precedence over anything that I feel like I'm losing. That's what David understood. Verse 7, you have put gladness in my heart more than in the season of their grain and wine increases. Okay, first thing I want you to notice, Lord, you have put. Look, here's what our faith is. It's not something that I'm asking you, work it up. Let's get charged up, rah, 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 yeah, 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 you can do it. Here's what our faith is. Don't rah, rah, rah it up. You can't do it. But God can do it for you. That's ours. You see, that's totally opposite of the world. In fact, that's what verse 7 is about. He says, God, you've instilled instilled within me this gladness. Hey, man, eternity's waiting for us. Guys, gals, are you still going to heaven? All right, just checking. (laughs) Just checking. All right, you're still going to heaven. God puts a gladness in your heart every time you think about that. You know, the end of the game for you is heaven. That's pretty cool. He says, the gladness that you put in me while I'm being thrown out of town, while I'm being attacked by my own army and my own son, you put a gladness within my heart that is what? That is more than in the season of their grain and wine offering. More than the greatest party this world has ever had. That's how great the gladness of God that he has put within me is better than any red carpet party that I can go to. It's better than anything that this party on world, I got something better than that. That's what he's talking about. So God, you're my God and I will forever praise you. Verse eight, 
I will both lie down in peace and sleep. Remember, this is the evening psalm. So now he's getting the other one. He woke up. <laughs> this one here, I'll both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord. Make me dwell in safety. He says, I'll both lie down in peace. And I'll not just lie down in peace, but I'll also sleep for you alone, O Lord. Make me. God causes it to be so that I will dwell in safety. Here's what Bible commentator Morgan has to say. This is a glorious conception of peace. Jehovah gathers the trusting soul into a place of safety by taking it away from all the things which trouble and harass. The tried and tried child of his love is pavilioned within his peace. Is that beautiful? Is it, I mean, I love the Psalms. I hope you end up loving them as much as I do. Jesus said this in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And sometimes when we think things are being taken away from us, like David, you are actually being blessed. Because those things that you thought were helium balloons may have been weights in your life. And it isn't until those things are taken away from you. And maybe even you're locked up. I talked to a brother today at Teen Challenge and he says, oh man. He says, I, I, I would hate to even show you my rap sheet. He goes, it's long. But God has made me a new creation. <laughs> oh man, come on. <laughs> come on, is that a gladness that's put in you even though everything else may be taken away from you? Let's pray because I want to pray tonight for the brokenhearted who have circumstances and situations and accusations against them and it's been hard for you. And I want you to know that God is saying to you tonight, you can count on me. That's what God's word is. Don't you give up. God says, not one of my saints who has ever counted on me has ever been ashamed. That's, that's amazing promise from God. God, we are counting on you. Just tell him in your heart of hearts right now, God, I'm counting on you. I'm counting on you for my life. I'm counting on you for my wholeness. I'm counting on you for my finances. I'm counting on you for my forgiveness. I'm counting on you because you, Lord God, are my help. Lord, you see my hurt and you see my brokenness. I will not be fake or phony before you. You know the real me. And I open my heart before you, Lord, that you might fill it with new hope, with fresh expectation of what you can do, Lord God. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this night of teaching in your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name.